Would you believe that the difference between failing the USMLEs and scoring in the 260s or higher could be as simple as changing how you use UWorld? It may sound too good to be true, but as a 99.9 percentile step one scorer who matched at Harvard MGH, I've seen it happen time and again, including someone who failed step one and in under two months, scored a 262 on his NBME before passing his retake. The key lies in understanding how to approach UWorld to maximize your learning, retention, and application so that you can score higher in less time. In this video, I'll share the top six mistakes students I've seen fail the USMLEs overcome to scoring in the 260s on step one and step two, all while using the same resources they were using when they failed. It's not about what you got, it's about how you use it. Mistake number one, assuming you must repeat UWorld multiple times. The advice to repeat UWorld originated many years ago when UWorld had significantly fewer questions. What most people don't realize is that over a short period of time, UWorld has dramatically increased the number of questions in its QBanks, and it may not be for the reason that you're thinking. UWorld Step 1 questions increased from 2,519 in January of 2019 to 3,796 in October 22, which is a 50% increase in just a few years. The Step 2 QBank increased from about 2,300 to 4,077, which is a 77% increase. I know what you might be thinking. Maybe you just need to know more. And so over the short period of time, they just increase the number of questions. However, I think that the reason may be more nuanced, which should impact how many times people think that they should be doing their QBanks. So what people may not remember is that Amboss came into the US in about the spring of 2017. They had all these big promotions and people were you know, jumping on board and they had like all this, you know, they were giving free subscriptions and things like that. It's hard not to notice that only like a year or two after that, UWorld started dramatically increasing the number of questions in its QBank. My personal view on this is, is that UWorld may have made a business decision. Before that time, a lot of people would be doing multiple QBanks. And the, the big question was, oh, what should my second QBank be since you know UWorld only had about 2,000 some questions? Now, with Amboss coming in really strong, it's hard not to think that UWorld made a business decision to try to increase the number of questions to A, kind of crowd out the competition, and B, to increase their price, which we all know they've been doing over the years. So how does this impact you, right? One thing to recognize is, is that A, if you're using effective learning strategies like spaced repetition, you may not need to do more than one passive UWorld and may not even need to do a single passive UWorld. Spaced repetition, as we've talked about, involves reviewing materials at an increasing interval to promote long-term retention. So if you remember the questions well the first time, based on your studying the first time that you went over the material, you may not need to do another passive UWorld because you might understand it so well. Instead, what I would recommend is trying to learn things well the first time so you don't need to repeat the questions again. Mistake number two is that assuming that just by doing lots of questions, you're necessarily going to improve your score. It is true that the people who score the highest on the USMLEs tend to be doing more QBank questions per day. So it's natural to assume that if I see someone doing 80 to 100 plus questions and they score really high, that if I should just do 80 to 100 plus questions, that I should see my score skyrocket to a similar extent. Now, the logic is alluring. There's a lot of good reasons to expect that QBanks are supposed to help, and they do, right? The testing effect is real, it's powerful, it improves learning, retention, and ability to apply information. And all of these things are critical for doing well on an app application heavy exam like the USMLEs. However, remember that correlation is not causation. Let's think about this. So even a casual basketball fan knows that NBA players who take the most shots on the team tend to make the most money. Now, if I increase the number of shots that I take that I'm going to make more money, no, of course not, right? The reason why the people that take the most shots make the most money is because of something independent of the number of shots that they're taking, which is that the players with the most skill are the ones that are trusted to take the most shots, and the players with the most skill are also given the highest salary. In a similar way, we shouldn't assume that just the number of questions is going to be the cause of why someone increased their score so much. Instead, it is likely a sign of how strong someone's foundation is. For example, I see this happen a lot where someone that comes in that doesn't have the strongest foundation says, oh my gosh, I need to just do lots of questions because that's what my school is telling me. Because again, the schools are looking at this and they're saying, oh, well, our best students are you know, doing lots and lots of questions per day. And so of course we should tell all of our students to do lots of questions per day because the students that are most successful are doing this. The issue comes when students who are not particularly strong, who 
probably should be spending more time reviewing the questions, which means that they're going to have to do fewer questions per day, decide, oh, okay, I need to just increase the number of questions that I'm doing. Let me give an example. I mentioned the student that failed step one and then scored a 262 on his NBMEs in under two months before he retook and passed his test. By the end, he was doing probably 80 to 100 questions per day, just like everyone else. However, in the beginning, he slowed down dramatically. In the beginning, he was doing maybe like five or 10 questions at a time and really, really, really making sure that he understood everything in the question and making sure that he understood the material so well that he could get that or any related question correct in the future. And so the key is, is don't obsess about vanity metrics like the number of questions that you're doing, especially in the beginning. Instead, make sure that whatever you learn, you learn it well enough and remember it using spaced repetition so that you never forget it. Do you wanna move beyond just knowing what resources you use and understand how? Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons so you can get higher scores in less time. Mistake number three is thinking that every question is about knowledge and not looking at interpretation problems. For a lot of the exams that we've taken in our lives, if we get a question wrong, it is often because we just didn't know the required knowledge. And so it's sort of like holding a hammer. Everything ends up looking like a nail. And for the most part, everything can be treated like a nail in medical school until we get to the USMLEs. So for example, most med school exams are really about knowledge recall. And the reason for this is pretty simple. Professors who write the questions are not paid, they're not promoted, and they're not trained to teach. And so they are essentially incentivized to write easier questions, which end up being kind of the regurgitation type questions that you see on med school exams. It's sort of the equivalent of an ungraded assignment for them, and they're going to act accordingly. However, for the USMLEs, as we discussed, it isn't about regurgitating facts, but rather about applying concepts, which opens up a whole ton of new avenues to ask questions and to get them wrong. And so the key is, is that when you're reviewing questions, look at why you're missing them. Are you missing it because it's a key concept? Did you not actually understand what the question was asking? Did you eliminate an answer choice because one thing didn't feel right? I was talking to a student recently who she said that she constantly would get questions wrong that she knew the knowledge for. And as an example, she said that there was a, it was a question, she, she wants to go into pediatrics and so she knows a ton about pediatric conditions, yet she still got a question wrong about Klinefelter syndrome. And she said that the reason was that everything fit with Klinefelters except the patient wasn't tall. And she was like, well, I thought the classic patient in Klinefelter filters were tall. And so because it felt kind of uncomfortable to them, they eliminated the answer. Now, this is independent of knowledge. This is just the way that they wrote the question so that you had noise, you had something uncomfortable. They ended up eliminating that answer choice because it wasn't perfect and then choosing the next best answer, which obviously was a wrong answer. And so all of these things point to the fact that if you assume that everything is about knowledge, you're going to miss a large number of questions, especially if you know a lot of things already. Mistake number four is reading the last sentence first. It is true that on one hand, knowing the question type, like is it a management question, is it diagnosis, is it pathology, is it ethics, can be helpful. However, what I would argue is, is that the impact of this strategy is limited and your time could be better spent elsewhere. So unlike the SATs where this advice is more common and frankly more helpful, or even the MCAT, for step one and step two, most questions are gonna be reasoning based and they're going to follow the famous two-step reasoning process. Knowing the second step, which is the question type, doesn't necessarily help with the first step, which is oftentimes understanding the underlying condition or knowing the diagnosis or something like that. Let's say that I, I know a question is about arrows. That doesn't necessarily help me identify the condition, which is maybe a myocardial infarction, or maybe it's gonna be heart failure, or maybe it's gonna be a PE, right? Knowing that I'm going to have to answer a question where the arrows are up or down is not going to help me really much at all with the first part, which is the critical part, which is understanding what condition it is. The other reason why people will sometimes say you need to read the question first is, is that there are some questions that can be answered without reading the entire vignette. Now note that this is rare. I would estimate that maybe at most one to two questions per block, you could go through and just know the question and by just reading the last sentence, not have to read the entire vignette. So what I would argue is, is that it's not worth spending the time reading the last sentence for every question just to get those few instances where it might help you. The other thing is, is that in a high stakes exam, how many students are really going to feel comfortable reading just the last sentence and say, oh, okay, now I don't need to read the vignette or I don't need to read the stem. I'm just gonna answer it based off of this, right? Most people won't. And so realistically, you're still going to spend that time going back and reading the rest of the vignette. Again, the issue isn't that by reading the last sentence, you don't gain 
gain useful information, you do gain useful information. The question instead is, what is the best use of that time? And so I would argue that the best use of that time is to focus instead on connecting the different sentences and the signs and symptoms of the vignette. So students often look at each sentence independently and they fail to make crucial connections. So for example, let's say that a patient comes in and they've got chest pain and they're also tall and skinny. Oftentimes people will read those two things independently and they won't take the extra time to try to connect it and say, hmm, how could someone having acute onset chest pain and being tall and skinny be related? And so connecting the dots between seemingly unrelated information in the, in the vignette is actually the more valuable skill and the more valuable use of time than spending that time reading the last sentence first. This strategy helps you build a comprehensive understanding of the case and leads to more accurate question answering. Mistake number five is, is that you memorize rather than understand the information. As we discussed, memorization may be enough to get by medical school exams, but it isn't enough to tackle USMLE style questions, including UWorld. UWorld and other QBanks are designed to test the application of concepts. And so to use these resources most effectively, you wanna focus on practicing the application of knowledge rather than just memorizing facts. And so when approaching a question, try to identify the underlying concept and principle. So for example, let's say that you have a question about serum osmolarity and urine osmolarity in, in SIDH. Oftentimes what I see is that people will try to memorize, oh, okay, well, SIDH leads to high urine osmolarity and low serum osmolarity because of inappropriately high ADH levels. Instead, try to understand the mechanism behind it. So if you have inappropriately high ADH, you're going to absorb more free water, which is gonna take that water out of the urine, which is gonna make it more concentrated, giving it a higher osmolarity, and you're gonna push it into the serum, which is gonna make it more dilute, and therefore decrease the osmolarity. If you understand this concept at a deeper level, it's going to make understanding everything else easier, as well as any other related questions, or if they modify the question in the future, like in cases of, say, diabetes insipidus or in cases of, say, you know, psychogenic polydipsia. And so by focusing on understanding the underlying concepts and their applications, you'll be better equipped to tackle USMLE style questions. Mistake number six is studying just to get the same question correct, but not all the related questions. This oftentimes happens when students are trying to cram and do lots and lots of questions in a short period of time, is that in order to save time and do more questions, they're going to just focus on the information that they missed in that particular question. The issue is, is that when the USMLEs are trying to test concepts, they can test one concept in many, many different ways. And so if you just memorized that one way that they've tested it in that one scenario, you're going to end up struggling when they change the ways that they ask it um, in other questions. This is, I think, the reason why a lot of students come out of their test and they say, oh my gosh, my test was nothing like UWorld, or my test was nothing like my NBMEs. It's oftentimes because A, they, they used a resource that where they were kind of memorizing the answers to the NBMEs me question, so they went in with sort of an unfair advantage that they didn't have on the real test, or B, that they, the way that they studied their QBank questions was more focused on trying to remember the specifics for the questions they got wrong, rather than understand and apply the questions so that they can get any related questions correct. I'll leave a link in the description below for how it is that you can use first aid as a tool to guide your understanding. Since first aid can act as a really effective filter, as a way to help guide you through understanding all of the related information that you need to know about a particular topic. So by focusing on understanding the underlying concepts and their interconnections, you'll be better prepared to tackle novel questions on the actual exam. One of the most common questions on Reddit for people who've done well is, what did you use? How many pages or you old questions did you go through? Remember, the key isn't what you've got. It's how you use it. But knowing how to overcome the mistakes of Yield is just one of the steps necessary to crushing the USMLEs. In this next video, I'll explain the top mistakes people make when using first aid and how to overcome them. 